Welcome to part two of our video series on chemical separations. In this video, we will be focusing primarily on distillations as a means of separating volatile chemicals from one another. As we learned in the last video, distillation exploits the difference in boiling points between two or more chemicals to allow for their separation. We also learned that a distillation will require a special apparatus. However, in this video, uh, we will also look into how the configuration of that apparatus can affect the efficiency of the distillation process. So what exactly do we mean when we say that something is boiling? We've all come across the phenomenon in our, our kitchens, but what does it mean in a chemical sense? So let's say we have a, a flask, a beaker, that's full of some liquid chemical. Let's say it's water. And we zoom in on the surface of that water. Okay, right at the interface, below the interface, you're going to have liquid water. And above it, you're going to have air. Now, below the surface of the water, you have all these molecules of water that are kind of bunched together, condensed together. But every once in a while, a couple of those water molecules will escape from the surface into the air above it and then ultimately it will be reclaimed uh, such that an equilibrium is going to be established where there will always be a certain amount of water vapor sitting above the liquid water. Now the pressure that's exerted by those water molecules is what we call the vapor pressure for that particular chemical. And every chemical, well every chemical will have its own associated vapor pressure for any given temperature. So let's say, again, we have a beaker, let's say it's full of water, or halfway full of water. And we know that the pressure of the atmosphere is constantly pushing down on the surface of the water in that beaker. But at the same time, the gas molecules, the water molecules being released from the water layer, are going to be applying a pressure against that atmospheric pressure. Now, according to the ideal gas law, you can probably surmise that at lower temperatures we would expect for the vapor pressure to be low. And at higher temperatures we would expect for the vapor pressure to be higher. So ultimately we wind up with a situation where you can see three different uh, situations where of, of, of relationships between the vapor pressure and the atmospheric pressure. We can either have a situation where the vapor pressure is significantly less than the atmospheric pressure, or we can have a situation where the vapor pressure is greater than the atmospheric pressure. And then, of course, there's a situation where the vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure. Now, in the cases where the vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure or greater than, what we have is a scenario where the liquid layer is actually going to be, I'm sorry, actually, the, the vapor being produced by the liquid is going to overcome the atmospheric pressure, allowing for the release of the vapors. Um, and this is what we call boiling. So therefore, the, the boiling point of a chemical is going to be the temperature at which the vapor pressure of that chemical is equal to the atmospheric pressure. So why is it exactly that different chemicals have different boiling points? To answer this question, what we need to do is remind ourselves of what boiling actually is. When we boil something, we are converting it from the liquid phase to the gas phase. Essentially what we're doing is putting more space in between the individual molecules of the chemical. Molecules that have stronger forces holding them together are going to be more resilient to the boiling process than those that have weaker uh, forces holding them together. So if we look back at the uh, list of intermolecular forces that can hold different molecules together, uh, we might remember that there are four major ones. Uh, the first is the Coulombic attraction, which is basically uh, due to the attraction between a positive and negative charge. There's hydrogen bonding, dipole-dipole uh, interactions, and the weakest of these is a van der Waals interaction. By recognizing this phenomenon, we can actually go on to draw some very important conclusions. First, we can say that polar compounds, since they um, are held together by stronger forces, will have higher boiling points. Nonpolar compounds would then co have a corresponding lower boiling point 
due to the weaker forces that hold them together. In fact, the most nonpolar compounds are only being held together with van der Waals forces. Now, all things being equal, the larger a compound is, the higher its boiling point is going to be. Now, when I say all things being equal, I mean if they have similar polarity. And the reason for this is that a larger molecule will have more opportunity for van der Waals interactions uh, than a smaller molecule will. All right, so let's say we want to put this knowledge into practice. Uh, let's say that we have a flask, and that flask contains um, a mixture of two chemicals. Let's pretend that one is red and one is blue, and when we mix them together, we wind up with a purple chemical. If we put that in a round bottom flask, and then attach an adapter to it, and as you can see here, the adapter that I've shown um, basically changes the path of where the vapors can go when the flask is heated up. There are uh, two different exit ports there, one for a thermometer and one to attach this funny piece of equipment uh, called a reflux condenser. And that condenser right there has two ports on the side and those two ports allow us to flow water right next to the, uh, uh, to the tube that holds the gases. And that will recondense the gas into a liquid. Now we add one more adapter to uh, direct the liquid that's produced in the downward direction and then we can attach a thermometer so that we can track the temperature of the vapors inside the distillation apparatus at any given time. Then we can put a, a flask of some sort underneath the uh, receiving end of the distillation apparatus and begin heating the flask. All right, so let's say that the blue chemical has a lower boiling point than the red chemical. That means that it will uh, begin to vaporize first and make its way up through the flask into the uh, adapter where it will start touching the uh, thermometer and we'll start seeing the thermometer read the temperature of boiling or the boiling temperature for that blue chemical and over time the blue chemical will be completely removed from the flask and at this point we would expect that the um, red chemical much having a much higher boiling point uh, would not quite be boiling yet once all the blue is gone during that time, we expect to see a drop in temperature in the thermometer because nothing's touching it. But eventually, once enough heat has accumulated uh, in, the uh, in the flask, we would expect for the red chemical to begin to vaporize as well and follow the same path that the blue did. And ultimately, we wind up separating the two chemicals uh, based on their boiling points into two separate flasks. Now, as it has been presented, it would appear that distillations are very simple, straightforward, and efficient processes, giving us complete separation of two volatile chemicals. However, this is not typically the case. Uh, usually, we don't see such a clear-cut uh, separation of chemicals. Um, if we were to perform this type of a distillation uh, in real life, we would probably find that we do not get complete separation but rather we would wind up with two fractions, one that is uh, enriched in the blue chemical and one that is enriched in the red chemical. Now, this problem is even further uh, complicated when we have uh, chemicals that we're trying to separate that have very similar boiling points. So that's one big thing to note here, that the efficiency of a distillation is going to be strongly dependent upon uh, the difference in boiling points. Now fortunately, there is a trick that we can uh, kind of play on the chemicals here. And in order to separate two chemicals that have relatively similar boiling points, what we can do is add an additional uh, column for the chemicals to pass through during the distillation process. This increase in surface area between the uh, initial material to be distilled and the condenser uh, gives the opportunity for more equilibration. And the more equilibration, the less likely we are to see um, the higher boiling chemical bleeding into the lower boiling chemical. And thus, we are able to increase the efficiency of our distillation. Uh, sometimes people will go so far as to use um, a column that has little fingers of glass on the inside uh, to even to, to make sure that there's even a greater uh, surface area for those equilibrations to take place. 
uh, that type of a column is called a Vigro column. To review, in this video, uh, we have learned how to construct a distillation apparatus uh, by using laboratory glassware that is available to us. We also took some time to explain the concept of boiling and what types of uh, structural features can impact the boiling point of a compound. And then finally, we looked at certain factors and how they can uh, affect the separation of chemicals. For instance, we saw that a large boiling point difference is favorable when trying to have an efficient distillation separation. We also saw that the apparatus itself can be modified uh, to increase the path length of the vapor before it reaches the, um, the reflux condenser to allow for more equilibration and therefore better separation.